Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you into the church this morning. Thank you so much. I'd like to welcome those who have joined us online. Appreciate you being here with us and making this your place of worship. We're just trusting the Lord. I hope everybody's had a good Thanksgiving. We're looking forward to the uh, celebration of our Lord and Savior's birth over the next uh, few weeks and uh, of, uh, of December. So we're just excited about uh, what God's done for each and every one of us. If you will, this morning, let's all stand. Turn over to page number 567. Help us sing this old song, Joy to the World. <laughs> Thank you. 
chapter 8. I'm glad I know who Jesus is.
got to work on that. <laughs> all in all.
tonight at 6 o'clock and youth Christmas play practice at 4 o'clock and uh, the ladies Christmas dinner December 9th at 6 p.m. Uh, Christmas pajamas and uh, kitchen gadgets is the theme and uh, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> sign up sheet right up front and uh, mama needs a head count as far as for the catering any other announcements? Yeah. Also on the ladies we are doing the Christmas ornament game so they need to bring a wrap a wrapped Christmas orange. Yes. Any other announcements? <coughs> Any birthday this week? <coughs> all right, Nick. All right. Okay, all right. Happy birthday. <coughs> Unspoken prayer request, raise your hand. And She wants to thank each of you for all your prayers and thoughts and phone calls, text messages. It's good to see her back. Yeah, we stand and we get some ushers, please. <laughs> Pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you today and all you've done for us, Father, Lord. Just thank you for giving us a place to come and worship you, Father. Father, if I, the further further to this service, Father, just touch Brother Austin, Father, just uh, wrap him in your arms, Father, touch him spiritually, Father, physically, Father, Lord, just give him the words to say, Father, Father, and each person here, Father, just clear their hearts and minds, Father, they'll just uh, listen to what you have to say, Father, Father, just use this offering, Father, for the further of your kingdom, Father, just use each of us in our everyday walk, Father, that we may uplift you and people will see you through us, Father. That we can be that witness for you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> you stand and welcome everyone around you to the house of God today. Do that real quick today.
hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. It's good to see folks back. We know that you were traveling through the week. We're glad to have you back safe today. Some of our folks are still doing their Thanksgiving thing. And then some of our folks are just not able to be here this morning, so we ask you to continue to pray for them. It is good to have Miss Dolly back today, as Josh has already mentioned. I want to mention Miss Melissa. She has a pretty lengthy surgery coming up on Friday, and she's had kind of a tough week this week. And so uh, do keep Miss Melissa in your prayers as uh, that day approaches. And I just wanted to say this morning, uh, for the first time in the history of the world, it's good to have Miss Elizabeth Coleman with us today. Stand up and show her off a minute right there, Miss Holland. Just do that. Appreciate y'all bringing her to church with you this morning. Appreciate that so much. And uh, if you have your Bibles today, and I hope you do, and you'll turn with me to Acts chapter number 24. Acts chapter number 24. If you'll turn there. Uh, just let me say while you're turning, it is a blessing to have you today. More weather just like we like it, ain't it? Uh, rain last night, sunshine today. I mean, that's good, isn't it? And that's just like we'd order it. Uh, today I want to talk to you about this particular topic uh, and thought, title, if you will, Remembering Conviction. Remembering Conviction. One of the pastors that I like to listen to, he pastors Middle Tennessee Baptist Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He does a lot of work in seminaries. A very fundamental person and uh, he was at a seminary the other, well, few, I guess it's been uh, a little while back now. Uh, but uh, they had him there to speak to seminary students, obviously. And this particular group of students he was speaking to was a group of young prospective preachers. Uh, they were there studying theology. And so just, uh, you know, just a whole room full of young men is what it was. And had a couple of the... Uh, you know, the, um, uh, the faculty members sitting up here behind him on the platform and uh, several of the professors out there that was, you know, that was different classes. And he started his uh, address to them by saying, how many can remember being convicted before you were saved? He said, two hands went up. Two hands only went up. And those were the two hands of the administrators behind him. The rest of them had no clue what he was talking about. How many could remember being convicted before you were saved? John R. Rice, the first editor of the Sword of the Lord, he wrote in some of his uh, writings, and he said his greatest fear of the 20th century is conversion without conviction. Conversion through coercion. That doesn't work, church. Doesn't work at all. Amen. And so can I say today, I hope that if you're sitting here, if you're watching, listening to us, thank you for tuning us in today. But I hope you can remember when you were convicted before you were converted. <laughs> because if you can't, you're not converted. <laughs> can I say that? It just don't work no other way. It won't work without conviction. And so, and, with, and the conviction, by the way, won't work without truth. Yeah, it won't work without truth. There is people who are Un, unjust, unjustifiably convicted. They're unlawfully convicted, but the reason they are is because they were, they were the, tr that was, the lies that were about them were presented in such a way that a jury believed it was truthful. And so you just can't have conviction without truth. And so today we want to look at an example of conviction uh, in, the, in the scriptures and uh, talk about how that works Talk about how it's not working today. Talk about how you and I should have continued conviction about our heart and life. That meaning that the Lord, he wakes up our consciences and he gives us a good conviction about things. We, matter of fact, you and I as believers, we live our convictions and not our circumstances. Would you agree with that statement this morning? And so when Christ... Uh, said that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, he meant that. Can I say today that he is a salvation? And we can find it in no other Peter writes, or, or Luke writes, as Peter said in the book of Acts, it is the only name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. I mean, he is our salvation. He is the mediator between God and man. It's all about him. I'm thankful today that when I grew up in a time, and I'm not trying to 
uh, just how especially young people sitting here today and think, well, we're in a terrible disadvantage because we didn't grow up in the days he grew up, or we didn't grow up in the days our, our parents did or our grandparents did, so therefore we're missing something. Let me tell you something, young folks, you're not missing it. I'm afraid the older folks like us is what missing it. Why? Because it was good to grow up in a time when churches actually taught the fear of God. Amen. They taught the fear of God. Not that you had to be afraid of God if you belonged to him. That's not it. No, no, no. He's your greatest friend. But they taught sinners to be afraid, listen, to, to go in out and to even think about going out into a Christless eternity without God. And so they taught that. And you might say, well, all of that worked good in the Old Testament, uh, but there, there's no reason really uh, because God has placed all of his judgment upon Christ, and so uh, therefore all of that's pretty much, you know, it's satisfied, and uh, nobody really has to deal with that. Uh, how many in here has read the book of Acts? You read the book of Acts? Did you, have you, ever, did you notice that chapter number 5 is actually in the New Testament? And did you notice that chapter number 5 was after the cross? Did you notice that? You might say, well, what happened in chapter number 5? Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit because they were hypocritical in their actions, trying to per per personify, if you will, something that they were not. They died in front of Peter. They died in front of Peter. And as a matter of fact, young men came and buried them. They died. That's the New Testament. That's not the Old Testament. What about Acts chapter 12? In Acts chapter 12, Herod, gloating in the fact that People that, you know, were listening to him talk said, oh, it's the voice of a God. He just embraced that. And I won't describe what happened to him because it's pretty vividly described in the text. I won't describe it because you hadn't ate lunch yet. <laughs> that happened after the cross. Yes. That happened in the New Testament. Yes. God is still real, church. Amen. God is not limited by what we think he can or cannot do. No, no, no. You and I should know what he can do. And I'm telling you, if you're an unsaved person, you ought to be afraid of what he can do. Amen. You ought to be afraid of what he said he's going to do. Yes. You should be afraid of what he said is going to happen to you. Yes. You should be afraid of that. Churches don't teach that today. Yeah. It's better if we can just get a bunch of folks to raise their hands or somehow or another coerce them into being saved. That's a lot better. Oh, I'm telling you, friend, they get some numbers out of that. But I, you know what? It's really worthless, isn't it? It's worthless. Yeah. Absolutely worthless. You Listen, I'm telling you something good news. I'd love to have this charge packed out. Amen? I tell you, I'm not one of these kind of fellows that's got this maintenance in mind. No, 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 as long as we can keep the church doors open, thank you, Jesus. Look, you believe he's, hey, with the investment he's made into me, with the investment he's made into our lives, with the wonderful word he has given us, with the Holy Spirit to work with, with Holy Ghost, heaven said, heartfelt, sin arresting conviction, no other group on earth has that. Amen. With all of that, would you think he's pleased with me? Just, oh, we can just keep the lights on and the doors open. Oh, gosh, help me. Help me not to be that way, Lord. Oh, no, no, no. And so today, if you look at verse 24 of Acts chapter 24, let's read about three verses here. And we'll look for a moment at a man named Felix, his wife, Drusilla, and St. Paul, the preacher that's mentioned here, and see what happened and what's taking place in this particular passage. Notice verse 24. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Verse 25 is our text. Notice 25. And as he reasoned, that word reason means spelling it out there. He reasoned. Notice this. Of righteousness temperance or self-control. How many knows when you receive Christ into your heart, hey, your words and actions change, amen? <laughs> Things you used to do, you don't do no more. Oh, no, no, the Holy Spirit wakes that conscience up and he gives us discernment. He gives us conviction. Righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled 
and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for you. Notice Felix trembled. If you cross-reference that in the Greek, you'll find that Felix got afraid of going to hell. Felix understood that he was convicted, that he had not received Christ, that he had not put any sort of uh, belief in this Savior that Paul talked about. Paul reasoning got right where Pete Felix was living, addressed exactly what was going on in his life. Felix trembled. Can I say today that there was a time when sinners used to do that in altars in churches? Can I say there's probably people sitting in this very sanctuary, maybe watching me, that knows exactly what that's about? Can I say as a 10-year-old boy, just to reflect a personal reference here, I'm telling you, when I came down and, and to give my heart to Christ, there was tears in my eyes. My face was wet. Can I say I was brokenhearted? And I didn't really realize what sin was too much, but I was brokenhearted. Why? Because I understood, friend, that, hey, I needed a Savior and that God sent his son and he went through all of that just for little old me. And, hey, I came with a broken heart. My spirit was contrite. I was troubled. Amen. I was troubled. Amen. I got a problem when you got a coax a confession out of somebody. You got a coax a confession out of them, just leave them alone. Just leave them alone. Amen. Either they got it and the later they'll say it, there's a good possibility they can get it. Good possibility all they have was conviction. They took conviction for conversion and they got up with an empty profession and usually a lot of times don't even make one. Don't even make one. And so, friend, hey, uh, can I just insert this right here? And I don't want to embarrass anybody, but one of the last people to be saved in this very church house right here, one of the last people that I can remember that was saved here, and isn't that a terrible way to say it as a pastor that I can remember that was saved here? It's been a while since somebody was saved here. Amen. That should concern us, amen? Yes, it should. That should be a part of our prayers. And that should be a part of our desires, asking God to send people to be saved, asking God to give you and I a love and a desire for them, that they'll be saved. But one of the last people that I remember being saved here came from the back to the front. His wife came with him. Several more came with him. He came down and prayed, and as soon as he got up, after his prayer time, as soon as he got up, I was standing about right there, and he looked at me, and he said, I got something I need to say. I didn't have to coerce him. I didn't have to say, oh, you're going to feel better if you'll say this. I didn't have to say you're going to be stronger and you'll start growing if you'll confess this. I didn't have to do one thing to him. Not one thing. He said, i got something I need to say. And so we gave him the floor. What did he do? He confessed Christ. He confessed coming under conviction. He confessed that God had forgiven him of his sins. He let you and I know that something different, something new, something wonderful, something awesome had taken place in his life, his heart that morning. Amen. And as he was leaving that day, you know what else he said? I want to talk to you about being baptized. I want to talk to you about being baptized. Save people. Listen, you don't have to coerce them into baptism. Christ was baptized to identify with us. We're baptized to identify with him. Amen. That's just it in a nutshell. Amen. When they're really saved, these things are become evident, amen. These things become important. Yes. They have a desire for these things. I'm not trying to coerce anybody into baptism this morning, nothing like that. I'm just simply saying, that's the way it works. Old things pass away. Behold, behold, behold. Take a look at it. You'll see it. It's evident. It's there. All things become new. Amen. 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 <laughs> you notice the last verse. He said that he, he said, go thy way. For this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money or a bribe should have been given him a Paul that he might lose. Him, pay, pay him to let him go. Uh, wherefore, he sent for him the offender and communed with him. Father, I pray your blessing upon your word today. I pray your blessing, Father, upon what we'll say today. I pray most of all, Father, that you'll say it through us. Lord, it's one thing to try to, to ask you to, to try to bless what we're doing, but it's quite different, Father, when we ask you, uh, Lord, to put us into what's your blessing. 
Uh, Lord, you know the ones in this very congregation. You know the ones this morning, Father, you're trying to reach out there watching. You know the ones of us, Father, who can benefit. I'd like to think that I myself could benefit from something here. I'd like to think that about everybody in here. And, Father, it's conviction that we need today. This old-time heaven sent Holy Ghost conviction, Father. We need the fire of heaven to return into our services today. Father, we need to have a desire to see lost people, the Lord, come to know you as their personal Savior. We need to understand, dear God, the Lord, like Felix here, they can put it off, they can put it off, they can put it off, but there's going to be one day they put it off too long. They went too far. Father, they, they, it's, they, it's just behind them then. God, not that your mercy runs out, uh, but Lord, that they, that Father, their heart gets harder and harder and harder and colder. And so, Father, there's a time when it just don't matter anymore. It just don't make any more difference. Lord, their mind becomes reprobate, it's dead set, turned against the things of God. Oh, Father, I pray today that you would give us a love for somebody. Lord, that we would pray for them. Father, that we would be an example to them. Father, that we would be a witness to them. That we would have a desire for them. Father, not that we try to ram it down their throats, not that somehow or another, Father, we try to make it happen, but Lord, that we truly believe that it'll happen. And Father, we desire that you do something. I pray you fill altars around this place, Father. I pray that the conviction of God, Lord, if we don't live by conviction, then Father, we can't come here and join as a group and see the workings of conviction. And so help us, dear God, to remember conviction, to remember when it was the awesome, wonderful tool of the church, Lord, that the Holy Ghost used, Father, that people, the Lord could not escape, Father, that they'd have to do something about it in their life, it would trouble them, they couldn't rest, Father, they couldn't, things just didn't go right, it was constantly bearing down upon their thoughts, their need of a Savior, their need of salvation, Father, they became dreadful, the Lord of hell, they became fearful of going out into eternity without you, Lord, we need that again today. And so, Father, we ask you that you bless your message today. To preach it through us. Give us, Lord, compassion. And give us love, Heavenly Father. Give us a desire, Lord, that people might know that you are the wonderful Lamb of God. As John the Baptist said, that came to take away the sin of the world. That we might know, Heavenly Father, that there's no other Savior. There's no other choice that God made. There's no other way he made. Father, there's no other prescription he's prescribed. Father, it's only through and by your blood, Lord, that we'll escape the terrible punishment of sin. It's only through and by your blood that we'll escape a wasted life, that we'll escape the troubles, Father, that all the world deals with and goes through, and so many of us as well. It's only in those things, Father, that you have, that you have uh, Father, that you have mandated Lord, that you honor, that you wrote. Father, that you enforce. Dear God, that you support. Lord, that you have taken upon yourself to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, as we look back at our scripture, I'd like for you to think just a little bit about who we're talking about this morning. Now, let's look just for a quick second at Felix and Drusilla. One of the things that, uh, that we've got an advantage in especially during Roman times, is Rome. They love to keep good records. There were a number of historians. Josephus is probably the most prominent Jewish historian. Tacticus is probably the most prominent Roman historian. Tacticus had a lot to write about Felix. As a matter of fact, his name means happy or prosperous. Tacticus said this about Felix, that he was a bad and a cruel governor. He was appointed by the emperor Claudius himself. Uh, he was opportunistic. He was self-serving. Uh, he did, he was, uh, didn't mind doing injustice, as I've just read to you. He wanted to bribe Paul. He wanted Paul to bribe him, pay him, uh, to let him go. He knew that Paul didn't have uh, any reason to be locked up, but he wanted to do that. And if you read on in the text, you read the next verse, uh, you'll see that uh, Felix was willing to let Paul stay locked up for two more years just so he'd have some favor with the Jews. So Felix was very self-serving. He was ruthless in many ways. And so uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was a man that when the Bible said here, 
there. I, I told you this where you could really get a hold of what verse 25 is talking about. Felix was a wretched sinner. And can I say to you this morning, so was St. Paul. Amen. St. Paul said he was murderous. He was injurious. He did it as unbelieving. He said he was the chief of sinners. I'm here to tell you, this was one sinner sharing with another sinner where they could find hope, where they could find salvation. That's what this was. But you need to understand the kind of man that Felix was. Let's take a look at Drusilla just for a moment. Now, Drusilla wasn't a whole lot better. Drusilla was the granddaughter of Herod Agrippa I. If you remember Herod Agrippa I, Herod Agrippa I was the first royal persecutor of the church. You remember it was his father uh, that had all the infants killed trying to wipe Christ out. And so Herod Agrippa I, he had several granddaughters. We see another one of his granddaughters mentioned in the book of Acts. Her name is Bernice. Uh, there's another one that is Mary Anna, uh, but she is not mentioned in Scripture. Uh, they're also related to Herodias. Do you remember Herodias? She was one that got John the Baptist's head cut off. They were, these were ruthless women. Uh, Dr Drusilla was married to King Aziz to begin with when he became a Jew. She was married to him as a, as a if you will, a political uh, kind of a thing, a political connection like those kings did back in those days. But uh, after being married to him a while, she became unfaithful to him. She leaves him. And so Felix, he takes notice of her. The historians say she's a very beautiful woman. He takes notice of her. And so Felix actually marries her. Him being a Roman governor, he just usurped the law of the land. She was still married to the first one. But he marries her. And so historians say that it was actually Drusilla's urging that this meeting with Paul would be ended because she too, this conviction was setting in upon her heart and she understood more about the Jewish traditions and the Jewish law uh, than uh, Felix did and so she was one prompting him to end this. Josephus says about Drusilla by the way that she was killed in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius again procrastinating again waiting too long waiting too long to get out and she and her son was killed there by that volcanic eruption and so that gives you a little bit of an insight of who we talked about the kind of character the kind of attitude the kind of low morals, the kind of, you know, the kind of a, 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 a self-will that they were all caught up in. The good news in all that is today, it really don't matter how sinful you are. It really don't matter how sinful you've been. It really doesn't matter today when it comes to the blood of Jesus because his blood covers, cleanses all sin. It doesn't matter so much when it comes to the blood of Jesus. Listen how wrong you've been, what kind of attitude you had. I'm telling you, it matters a lot when it comes to eternal punishment in hell. It matters a lot to neglecting and usurping the Son of God and trampling underfoot His blood. It matters a lot, friend. I'm not saying your sin don't matter. It cost Jesus His very life. Amen. Yes, it did. High price would pay for your sin and mine. But the good news is today, because of Jesus, because He paid for it, because He covered it, it is covered. It is cleansed. It is gone. Hallelujah. And so, friend, when you look at these two he's dealing with here, we can see that, listen, this is not just, you know, your, uh, your, just, you know these, these people that are in position and they're real good role models. No, no, no. These were ruthless, cutthroat, politically minded, self-serving people. I'd like to read you a couple of uh, observations that um, Herbert Lockyer, some of you may know him, know his books, I'd like to read you a couple of observations he made. He made an observation and he calls it yesterday and tomorrow. And what he said in, these, in this little observation he made is they're the two sworn enemies of the soul. Never thought about it that way. But listen to what he said. He said, yesterday slays its thousands. He put this in light of the song that was sung about David and Saul. He said, yesterday has slayed its thousands. Past sins plunged many into darkness and despair. Priceless opportunities were trampled upon, and the harvest is past. But God says there is mercy, still and free forgiveness through repentance. That's what he said about yesterday. Tomorrow, he says, has slain its ten thousands. He said vows, promises, resolutions are never fulfilled. 
some other time, many say, when urged to repent and, to, and believe, they fail to realize that now is the acceptable time. How pitiful it is that the convenient season never dawns for them. The pathway to their hell is strong with good resolutions and tensions. And as they cross the great divide, the mocking voice cries out, too late, too late. I told you one time about uh, the little novel, the little uh, example that, uh, that C.S. Lewis wrote one time, and it was about the little demon called Screw Tape. He, he wrote the Screw Tape Chronicles. And in that, in that little chronicle, in that little example, uh, basically what he done is he had the devil sitting and listening to all of his demons, his imps and his demons, and they were all trying to come up with a way uh, to undercut or to usurp Christianity. They were trying to come up with some kind of a technique and a method that worked. And one of them, you know, just mentioned, well, let's just say it's all a lie. He said, that won't work. Too many's already believed. Some would say, well, let's just say there's no power in it. He said, that won't work. Too many's already received. And finally one, he went through a whole big list of them. And finally one just raised his hand and said, let's say wait. Wait. The devil said, that'll work. <laughs> said, that works. We'll just run them out of time. They'll be convicted, but they'll wait to a better time. They'll wait to a more convenient time. A lot of people today say, well, when I'm older, I can handle this God stuff. When I'm older and I'm not younger, when it won't matter so much, when I'm not as socially active, when I'm not as, you know, uh, as, as involved in the community, when uh, just lots so many people are looking or whatever, when I get everything done I want to that I know is ungodly and not a set right with the scripture, when I get all that done, then I'll do, you know, I'll do good things. I'll just wait. I'll just wait. The problem with that is they can't, listen, they can't guarantee five more minutes in this life. They can't guarantee another day. They can't guarantee that they'll have next Thursday at 3 to come to God. They can't guarantee none of that kind of stuff. No, no, no. Can't guarantee you'll even get home today. You and I should not be walking around with a death wish. No, no, no. That's not what I'm implying. I'm just simply saying, as the Scripture says, over and over and over and over, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Come before the Lord while he is near. Come into his presence while he's there. I'm here to tell you today, friend, listen, when you stand before God, you cannot say, I ran out of time. You should have gave me more time. You will not be able to say that today. No, no, no. He'll be justified in saying, depart from me. I never knew you. I gave you an opportunity. You rejected it. I, play, I set it out for you. I made it straight for you. I made it plain for you. It didn't matter to you. You rejected it. You said, I love sin more than I love you. You said, I love sin and the things of the world more than I do this warning of my eternal damnation. No, no, no. I'm here to tell you today, friend. Hey, we'll be in front of him without an excuse. Amen. I want you to know something. He loves you this morning, but it's time conviction returned to the church. It's time, friend, listen, that when you give an invitation, sinners get afraid of facing an eternity without God. And it's time you and I woke up this morning and said, you know what? We're tired of our loved ones going to hell and us knowing about it. We're tired of our loved ones being lost and undone without God and us knowing about it. We're tired of those things happening and us knowing about it. I'll tell you something. It don't hurt to shed a few tears over some lost folks. It don't hurt, friend, to go out of your way sometime to be good to some lost folks and to let them know, friend, hey, I'm telling you, if you've got a heart convicted toward them, you have a desire toward them, uh, listen, if you don't hear anything else I said this morning, how about letting this sink in? The Holy Spirit will open doors for you. Yes, he will. He'll open doors for us. He'll give us an opportunity. He'll get their attention. We just don't fail in showing the goodness of God. Oh, preacher, I just don't know nothing about the Bible. Well, whose fault's that? Whose fault is that? Say it's yours. You don't make it plain enough. I'll agree. But, hey, I do need help. How about, how about praying for me in those prayers? Yes, I'll agree. How about praying for your teachers in those prayers? But listen, friend, hey, you and I have the Bible. As hands went up last Sunday, uh, hey, people raise their hands. I've got a Bible out. I can see it over there. Listen, we have the Bible. We're living in times, friend, when it's never been easier to.
to get the scriptures in here. Oh, we have no excuse. Listen, you know someone, you know that person pretty well, you know what they're dealing with, you know the things that's got them, you know, bailed down, you know the temptations that they succumb to, you know their habits and all these kind of things. Why don't you then go to the Word of God because the Word of God addresses every bit of that in a very personal way, even for them. Go to the Word of God and start studying those things and ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, give me an opportunity to lovingly use these things to help steer them that person to you. That way when they ask you a question, you answer it. That way they, when they want to know something that you can give them, listen and answer. So many people are afraid of this because they just don't know nothing. Well, my goodness. Friend, that's just admitting, well, we're not willing to read the Bible. We're not willing to, you know, allow that our mind to be re renewed. We're not willing to do that. Can I say today that one of the Things that Satan would love for you and I to totally abandon. Listen, is this, this working of conviction, this active agent that causes, listen, people's hearts to be arrested, that causes them to sense that guilt, friend, and they'll understand that without Christ, they are condemned to a burning hell. I'm here today, friend, to tell you, God, his mind is not changed on this. Man might change this Bible some. Man might put in, listen, he might change it, the doctrines and the approaches and all these kind of things. But I'm here to tell you, God's mind is not changed on this. It's still there. People still go. And friend, when you and I think about today, the terrible aspect of a person being caroused, if you will, or, uh, you know, coerced into thinking they're saved. I know some young people especially. I know some older ones too, but I know a number of young people that will tell you right now they done this Bible school thing or they, they did this after school ministry thing or they did this, you know, some conference thing or something like that. I'm not saying those things are bad. That's not what I'm saying. But they did those things, and they accepted Christ then, so they're saved. And there is absolutely no evidence of their salvation. Absolutely no evidence. No. I mean, they could care less. They hadn't been in church since. Some of them hadn't been in church, period. But I'm telling you, friend, listen, there's absolutely no evidence of that. And then there's folks today, friend, that, hey, they can be in church. Listen, they can be in church every Sunday. They get on the job. There's absolutely no evidence of it. They get in school. There's absolutely no evidence of it. No evidence of it. Why? Because, hey, one of the big reasons is ministries in churches are no longer ministries. They're just little social events. They're just little social things. We have bought into the lie that if we don't make everything fun, especially for young people, that they just won't get it. They just won't have it. They just can't accept it. You just can't bring the scripture and teach them the scripture because that just won't work. That's why we can almost count as the young people that's in this building this morning on two hands. I'm not putting this down. This younger generation don't care nothing about this. Why? Because church has been empty for them. They've been, listen, they've been socked in pacifiers. I'm telling you, they've been patronized. They've been treated like idiots. You can't handle this. You couldn't have this. We can't show you this. We can't tell you this. You'll get mad. You won't come back. You won't be part of the crowd. You won't be a part of the numbers that we can brag about. We've got... 30 or 40 or 50. You won't be, that won't be, that won't work. Would that be awful? Stand at the judgment seat of Christ. You know what Isaiah, what Ezekiel was told? The Lord told Ezekiel, he said, if you don't warn them, he said, I'll require their blood at your hands. In other words, Ezekiel, it's your fault they're in hell. It's your fault. It's your fault they didn't get saved. You didn't warn them. Now, if you warn them and they don't do anything about it, that's up to them. But he said, I'm expecting you to warn them. Heard a message one time that the title of that message was Whole Families in Hell. Some people got the attitude there's going to be a big party there. Some people got the attitude that there's nothing, absolutely nothing to it. 
I know you don't like this this morning, but can I say today, there is nothing greater, nothing gives me more pleasure, nothing's a grander blessing to me than when somebody really, truly accepts Christ as their personal Savior. Their heart is, listen, their heart is broken, their spirit is troubled. Friend, they really accepted him. There is evidence there. Then when they, listen, when they leave that place where they accepted them, it don't always have to be here. Listen, it can be wherever you're willing to meet him and that conviction has troubled your heart and you're willing to, listen, accept him as your Savior. It don't have to be here. But listen, can I say to you, there's nothing greater than that. Seeing someone come to know the Savior and seeing their life radically changed, amen. Young folks, I believe you could handle it. I believe you can. I believe that those programs I mentioned a while ago, like Bible school, after school ministries, all these kind of things, I, can, I believe they can be effective when the truth of the scriptures is used. Amen. When true repentance is, listen, is exercised, when we pray about them actually, not like Felix here, putting it off till later, keeping his focus, listen, on whatever the world is doing, I'm here to tell you, I believe they'll work today. Do you remember conviction? How many of you older folks? How many of you older folks? I better white wrap this up. How many of y'all remember going into the house of God? I'm not just talking about charismatic churches. Didn't know nothing about none of that back then. Some would say, oh, you go to the holiness church, I'll do that. Oh, friend, listen. I was thankful for the Pentecostal folks rejoicing, Amen. My mom sung in all of them. And the, some of the most lively services, listen, that I would go with her when I was younger, uh, when I'd go with them to sing or whatever, the most lively services we get in be at the Pentecostal church. Amen. I was thankful for the spirit moving there. Amen. It's not a denominational thing, but I'm about to say something that's going to shock some of you. I grew up in a Baptist church. And I grew up in a Baptist church where really, if you were just tactful, it was thought to be compromised. Half of, the, half of the messages that was preached in that place was from a negative slant. Half of it was what you're doing wrong. What you've done wrong. What that wrong was going to cause. Most of them were like that. But did you know, people got saved in them places? I'm thankful to be able to preach about, listen, about the love of Christ, about, listen, the position you and I have in Christ, about his wonderful grace. By the way, let me just tell you something. You may or may not know this. Did you know that the word grace is not mentioned in the, in the Gospel of Matthew? Did you know it's not in there one time? Did you know that the word grace is not mentioned in the Gospel of Mark? It's not in there one time. Did you know that Luke... One of the most pro prolific writers in the New Testament wrote more than anybody else in the New Testament if you go by words. He mentions it one time. John mentions it several times in his gospel. But the gospel of Luke only mentions grace where Christ was lost. You remember where they lost him in Jerusalem and went back, searched for him three days, found him. You remember that? The Bible said that he grew in the grace and favor with God and man. You remember that? That's the only time the word grace is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. You might say, well, what is your point? I'm thankful to preach about grace. I'm, I want to consider myself a grace preacher. But friend, did you know something? That in those old, hard shell Baptist churches, ladies, you couldn't go in there with a pair of pants on. They'd ask you to leave. They would. I'm not going to ask you to leave. They'd ask you to leave. Am I calling them wrong? No. That was just their conviction. They'd ask you to leave. But did you know what? Them people would shout that place down. That hymn that Sandra played a while ago for the offertory hymn, they'd sing those old Stamp Baxter songs like that. Them old church hymnals. I mean, you know, all they had to do was call out to, uh, they, they, it was just a lot of repetitive stuff. I'm not being critical. They call out 57. By the way, what's 57 in the old Stamps Baxter, in the old church hymn? What's 57? 
Amazing grace. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I mean, hey, you know what they go saying just by the number. They sung them a lot. Then people would shout that place down. Oh my gosh. Some of them would come to modern churches and they say, what in the world has happened to y'all? You're not celebrating the Savior no more. It's not focused on him anymore. You don't seem to be able to handle the gospel anymore. What's wrong today? You know what they would say? This is, the, this is what they would come to. You've lost your conviction. You're letting circumstances take over. You've gotten too worldly. That's what they'd say. And you might say, well, these people do that today. I'm going to tell you something I've noticed about some of the modern worship, and I'm not being critical of anybody. I've noticed that they really worship while the song's going on, and then as soon as it ends, it's like flipping a switch. They up and the down. They up and the down. Hands are up. All this is going on while the song's going on. Thankful it is. As soon as it's over, it's like flipping a switch. Can I use a name or two, maybe not offend somebody, and I'm going to be doing whole lot more in my notes right here, but I'm not going to go back to them. The church I grew up in, there were several, a lot, of, there were a, lot of, some of, a lot of them were women. A lot of them were widowed women. Some of them were women that their husbands just wouldn't come to church with them. There were several people, too. Several, when I say people, there were several men, too. And so several of these people get happy. And they might not... You just didn't know when it was going to happen. One of them was Miss Audrey Ferguson. How many in here do you, Miss Audrey? <laughs> Miss Audrey sat right. Miss Audrey sat right over there. Sat right over there. And there was three sets of benches in there, and she sat right over there. And Miss Audrey, you hear this? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And I, they might not be singing. Maybe they might not. I seen her do this one time right before they right before they prayed the, you know the 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 closing prayer. The Lord was stirring her. Thank you, Jesus. You hear? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, in a few minutes, ha hoo, ha hoo. She'd say she'd start shouting. I've seen her go out the front door shouting. Wasn't even having service. You say, well, what difference does that make? The Holy Spirit was upon her. That's what difference it made. It wasn't what she wasn't being coerced into anything. One lady down there liked to laugh. She get happy, she start laughing. Oh, the next thing you know, she's laughing. How many remember Miss Ella Crane? I'm gonna shut this up. How many remembers her? Miss Ella. About I don't know, every bit of what, four or two or something, right here. And she played the piano not all that well. She was an older lady then. And, I, and I'm sure it was probably, she probably had played better when she had better joints and things. But they'd ask her sometime, they'd say, Miss Ella, how about singing poor as a beggar and rich as a king? Boy, she knew what that was like. She was always a poor person. I, she sat right here. Sidney and I would sit behind her. And I used to aggravate her. I'd, tell, I'd, I'd call her chief. And she'd say, why do you call me chief? And she'd put her lips out. And I said, because you're the oldest person in here, Miss Ella. She said, how do you know that? I said, I'm just going by looking. She said, get up here, boy. I just aggravate her, you know. Pick at her. She liked that. If they had a singing group come, the piano set here, they'd all sit there. Well, she'd just make some of them move. That was her place. I mean, she's old-time Baptist. She goes sit in the same place. She'd make them slide over. She'd be sitting there with that six, six guys, you know. She'd be sitting there, a little white head. They'd ask her, they'd say, sing poor as a beggar and rich as a king. Somebody would say, well, why are you up there? Sing almost home. Well, she'd get up there and she'd start a little frailing on that piano. In a few minutes, I remember this one particular Wednesday night. Wasn't a whole lot of folks there. Wasn't a whole lot of things happening. This one particular Wednesday night, Miss Ella, Miss Ella is what they call her. Miss Ella, would you sing Poor as a Beggar and Rich as a King? She got up and she gave a little old testimony. She sat down and she started singing it. She had this real high voice. She started singing it. In a few minutes, she started shouting. 
and she's a shouting. <coughs> Miss Audrey started shouting. Another lady started shouting. Mr. Russell started shouting. Miss Betty started shouting. They were shouting all over that church. She got up. She had to leave the piano, and she was shouting. And she shouted, and she shouted, and she shouted. The pastor got up, and he was shouting. And I'm telling you, a few minutes, she said, Lord, I just can't handle it no more. And she shouted. And she said, Lord, I thank you, but I just can't do it. She shouted. In other words, the Holy Spirit was giving her strength. She didn't know she had. She just kept shouting. Some of you are looking at me today like, the oh, whole church shouldn't go that way. Boy, I'm going to tell you, it was really something when it did. It was really something when it did. And if there was somebody lost, a lot of times without any preaching at all, boy, here they come. I seen one guy one time run down the aisle. You'd have thought something was chasing him. He ran down the aisle. His face was wet. He done cried enough. He was getting his shirt wet. And he almost slid into that altar like he was sliding into a base. Boy, them old saints swarmed in there and prayed for him. I've seen them go into the baptistry. Most of the time back then, you know, they didn't, they, this, it was at the river. Churches didn't have baptistries. But I've seen them go into the baptistry when they got, the, got one come up out of that shouting. Oh, yeah. The power of God on them, man. It was real. It was real. Oh, we long for it, don't we? We long for that reality of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, when it's real, he'll heal people like Melissa. When it's real, things happen. Things take place when it's real. Oh, friend, listen. Thank you for listening this morning as Brother Donald comes, as our musicians come. Please consider today what is really needed in these modern times. Is heaven sent, heartfelt, dare I use the word old-fashioned, Holy Ghost conviction. That's what's needed today, church. I really believe it'll fill the pews up. I do. Christ didn't have a radio program. Christ didn't have a TV show. Christ didn't have the Internet. Christ wasn't on Instagram. He wasn't on Facebook. He didn't do Twitter. Oh, friend, listen, I'm not criticizing those things. They can be used for good. I'm just simply saying he didn't have this social media. What he had was the power of God. And you know what? People kept showing up. He couldn't even walk around for people. He couldn't even go out in public hardly. He'd tell them. He'd say, he'd say don't tell anybody about this. But they go and just talk and talk and tell it. When, you, when we read that, when he said, don't tell anybody about this, I'm using, I'm paraphrasing. There was a reason he told him that. It wasn't that he was just modest. Listen, he had a mission. He had a, a work he needed to complete. It was a little bit rough on him to do it when he couldn't even walk for the crowds. But why was it he couldn't walk for the crowds? Because he was the real thing. Oh, you let the word get out, good news is the real thing. That's really good news. They, they got the power of God working over there. Good people got the power of God working in them. Oh, I'm telling you, friends. Yes, you'll fill the benches up. Don't get upset if somebody sits in your seat. Just find another one. They'll fill the benches up. Yes, they will. Oh, friend, listen. I appreciate churches that do whatever they can do to get crowds. I do appreciate them wanting to fill up the house. But can I say today... I had rather, listen, I had rather have Jesus than anything else. May his presence fill you and me and this place. If you're sitting here this morning, you don't know him as your personal savior. Listen, he came and died just for you. The exact thing that you're into, involved with, whatever it is about your life, he came to cleanse you and to make you free like the girl sung. He came to be your all in all today. He came to do those things. He came because he loved you like the choir sung today. And can I say, if you'll accept him, you'll have everything he came to give you. Because all God requires of you, Jesus has given you. That'd been a good amen. Thank you. But listen, if you reject that, just walk away from that. 
If you like Felix, say, oh, we'll do it later. The Bible don't never give us, neither does the historians give us a time when Felix's life changed. Good possibility he screams in hell today. Thinking about the preacher, thinking about the man that God sent his way, that wrote five, wrote five about a one-fifth of the New Testament, thinking about this man that God sent to him that was under his authority, how he himself could have, could have seen him any time he wanted to, could have had him help him any time he wanted to. He'll think about that for eternity as the flames roar on. Amen? Yes, he will. You don't have to be that way. Is your heart troubled this morning? How many today can remember conviction before your conversion? Can you remember it? I see one hand back there. Can remember it. Conviction before your conversion. You know what it felt like for your heart to be troubled. You know what it felt like to know that you needed a Savior. You know what it felt like to know that, hey, without that Savior, you were going to be doomed and damned for eternity. You know what that felt like. You know what that felt like. Thank God you know what that felt like. Because listen, a conversion without conviction is no change at all. Some hang on for a little while and do a little better, but they finally fall away. Some would say, well, I got saved as a boy or girl. And you know, that was that was fine. But I did it back then. I just, I don't, there's nothing else I need. And I really don't need this God stuff either. I'm, as far as I know, according to what you Christians say, I'm okay. Jesus loves me. He forgives me. So my sin really don't matter. They see it as a license to sin, not away from sin. Peter said to make your peace calling and election sure. Because some have forgotten they were ever purged from their old sins. You remember last week how we tried to bring you a message on salt and light? If you remember in the Gospels when Matthew 25, when Christ was asked by his disciples about how we'll know the end times, what should we expect, what, should, what will be going on, what would be, be seen, there's one little verse, perhaps the most, the smallest verse in that text. And it seems to not quite fit. But this is what Jesus said. Remember Lot's wife. You remember that? Remember Lot's wife. That's almost right up there with Jesus' wept. That's a small little verse. Why is he talking about it there? Why did he say that? Remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? According to the scripture, she turned into a pillar of salt. In other words, a great example of dead salt, worthless salt. But the reason he said to remember Lot's wife, number one, Abraham prayed for Lot. And when it was revealed to Abraham from a hillside over here, overlooking the, overlooking the valley, seeing Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain, the Lord told him that he was going to destroy those cities. You remember what Abraham did? You remember his intercessory prayer? He said, will not the God of the whole world do right? Will God destroy also the righteous with the wicked? You remember how he started up here and how he just whittled it all the way down to 10? You remember that? Well, what happened? Two angels went to Lot's house. How many has had a couple angels show up at the house lately? Two angels went to Lot's house told Lot, go get your family, gather them in, kind of like Rahab did hers. Said, go get them, gather them in, go tell them. The Bible said his son-in-laws laughed at him. Mine probably does me sometimes. Said his son-in-laws laughed at him. Sorry about that, brother. Listen. They just saw him as one that mocked. Peter said that Lot's righteousness was vexed by their righteous living. But two angels came to his house, told him, said, go rescue your family, get all of them in here, had to deal with, you know, had to deal with that, uh, 
that, that attitude of sodomy that was all around them. You remember the story where these two angels go to his house. These two angels personally escort Lot, his two daughters, and his wife, personally escort them out of the house. But she loved Sodom. She loved sin. She loved the world. She loved the devil's way so much that she looked back and became a part of the, of the, <coughs> of the destruction of the city and was turned to a pillar of salt. Can I say it this way? Look at the grace that God bestowed upon that house. And she did what? Rejected it. She loved Sodom better. That's why Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Remember the rejection of grace. Remember the rejection of the actions God took. Remember the rejection of all that God had did for you. Remember the rejection of the intercessory prayer of Abraham. Remember, listen, what God did and how she rejected it and what happened to her. Remember that. I guarantee you one thing. Hell is full of believers today. Darwin's a believer today. It's full of believers. It's just too late. It's too late. It's not too late this morning. It's not too late for you and I to partake of the wondrous grace of God. It's not too late for us to show that to a world lost and dying without him either. I'm going to put you on the spot this morning. Raise your hand if you're going to single out somebody that you know is lost and you're going to pray for them. Raise your hand. Keep it up a minute because the devil sees it. Keep it up just a minute. You know what? The devil's going to hinder you in that. Yes, he is. He's going to hinder you. He's going to try. You put your hands down. Thank you. He's going to try to bring all sorts of busyness, all sorts of responsible needs. He's going to try his best to make you forget it. Now that person that you had in mind when you raised your hand, you pray for him, friend. You pray for him. Don't you fail to pray for him. Don't fail to pray for him. Don't fail to expect the Holy Spirit to be doing something on their behalf. Don't let the devil hinder you in praying for them. Don't let it slide. Don't just say, oh, I said I would. I, I meant to do that. No, no, no. Don't do that. No, no, it's like your Bible reading. You do it, friend. You'll have, to, you'll have to make time. You'll have to do it, but you do it. You pray for them. The devil was looking on, but so is the Holy Spirit. And friend, he's greater and he's grander. The devil can't hold an evil light to him. He is not God's equal. No, no, no. You pray for them that they'll have victory, that you'll see them saved, and that the Lord may even use you as a big part of that, and you're going to be a big part of that praying for them. Let's stand together today. Remember conviction? Remember how well it worked? You remember it working in our lives? That conviction's why you don't do certain things. You're convicted. It's not right. It don't fit anymore. That ain't what God's blessing. We live by our convictions, not our circumstances. Page 303. <laughs>
That without him, we can do nothing. But with him, hey, all things are possible. It's awesome, isn't it? It is. Any last quick word, anybody? Remember Christmas play practice at 10 o'clock. Thank you, Josh. And also, Bible study tonight. Please come back, fill up the classes. Pray for my teacher. He hasn't been doing all that good. And uh, pray for Brother Doug and Miss Dale as well, Brother Doug and Sister.